Hey everyone, how's it going? We, we are we not 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 nearly as compelling as the amazing art that we just saw. That was really fun. And that was so awesome. Yeah. And next time, maybe we just feed it our info and then they can watch a simulated yeah. fireside chat. So uh, I'm really excited uh, to chat with you today. Uh, you know, this is a night into the metaverse. Um, maybe to start, we'd love to, like, if you want to briefly touch on um, your background before uh, founding Protocol Labs, because you, you actually had a games company before, yeah. so you've been in the metaverse for, for a while. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I've always, like, really enjoyed and liked um, games and immersive environments. I grew up, um, I, I got into computers uh, through data and so I played a lot of, like, RTSs and so on, and do you use cool help? Yeah. Uh, so I, Grew up really enjoying um, any kinds of like different worlds and whatnot. Also, kind of like reading also things. Along the way, I got more into things like MMOs and things that could be like large scale immersive worlds with thousands or millions of players. I remember being fascinated by the fact that um, WoW at some point had more people online than uh, there were people that loved them. And that to me was super cool because that, that was something you had a city really of people living on um, their daily lives, building relationships, hanging out with each other, um, getting to know each other or not. Um, totally virtually. And uh, lots of other amazing environments and games that sort of got developed uh, like that. The, um, I was also like, it's super cool. But, uh, Really also to see uh, Bill Kier actually. Um, Second Life is this, such an instrumental piece of uh, developing that entire um, history of environments and worlds and, and um, life. And you know, along the way, I you know, got to a bunch of things. I studied computer science formally, um, and I uh, went into networks and service systems. Um, but games remained a big part of uh, what I was interested in. And so the first startup that I built. Um, we're making a, a game, so this was a location-based um, monster catcher. Before Pokemon Go, so this was like uh, 2012, 2013. Uh, it was called Geomon, and you could like go around the world and capture like um, world uh, spirits that you could bond with crystals. And, uh, it was like, you had like a big need following for for quite a while, and uh, that to me was a super cool exploration of how do you blend. It, it was not kind of like a, uh, it was kind of like reality augmented games. So instead of augmented reality games where you put something in your, in your face and then you walk around and you kind of like augment the, the reality, it was instead taking the reality of the world and using that to augment the experience of your game. Uh, I still think there's an enormous amount of space in that uh, that hasn't quite been explored yet. Um, all kinds of tricky privacy issues there, of like how do you deal with millions of people or hundreds of millions of people around the world interacting through through games like this. Um, but I think it's again like super fascinating uh, area to explore. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And I guess like um, in your opinion, um, what, do you, what do you make of like the progress thus far in terms of gaming, augmented reality, virtual reality? And, um, I guess back then with Geomon uh, all the way to today, uh, do you feel like you know, did you think back then that we would be at the point that we are today? Would we be further? Would we be behind? Like, I'm curious. Yeah, it's a great question. I really thought we'd be much further along. So, um, the types of the types of conversations happening in the early 2000s uh, really presaged this amazing kind of future where you have all kinds of super immersive games and worlds and experiences that you could go into. Um, it didn't turn out that way for a bunch of reasons. I think one of the big ones was it was this moment in time, right around when the social network started taking off, where the internet went from being kind of this other place that you were interacting with people, but you had like pseudonyms and all kinds of like different, um, you know, virtual identities, uh, and it became very real very fast. So you know things like Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on, um, kind of like made the internet a real place where real people had real lives and kind of quashed and destroyed a lot of the magic of the early internet, a lot of the, you know, fantastical virtual worlds that people were creating. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that happened. I think another thing that happened was 
um, gains became the successful gains financially became gains that were able to drive up either subscriptions or virtual goods um, revenue so, so that you've got this split between the games industry going into like the mobile games industry going into like dopamine loops that I could like just maximize the virtual good purchasing um, and the no sorry gross day for generalizing terms of like amazing cool gets out in all the way but um, but for the most part I think the industry hasn't really created the super compelling games that a lot of us grew up with and then the flip side, the you know, console environment, the deeper, more immersive games, um, there's just an enormous amount of exploration. But sort of MMOs didn't quite live on. I think maybe Final Fantasy XIV, um, I never played it, but I hear that you know, even to this day, a lot of people um, play a lot of it. There's been a number of these kind of immersive worlds, but they've been relatively niche, and nobody has quite been able to create like the 100 million player game that a lot of people uh, thought would have happened. Right? It was even part of popular fiction, you know, things from Ray Player One to you know, many, many um, books and, and uh, sci-fi and so on um, forecast this like super immersive environment where you would have you know, hundreds and hundreds of billions of people um, inhabiting these virtual worlds and virtual realities. And it's not clear why that hasn't happened yet. Um, it could be that creating those kinds of experiences is so difficult that a lot of the games you just sort of try, fail along the way, or have to compromise and, and go not a shorter. It could be that there's something about the interaction space that's just extremely difficult to get right, and you can't quite get the immersiveness to work well. Um, it could be that we're missing very strong, um, pervasive, like, uh, in incentive loops. And here I don't mean financial incentive, but I mean incentive loops that keep a lot of people um, they're in the games around the same periods of time, so you can get like a high impression. Um, and here, I'd send to like kind of like the uh, you know, things like in WoW, there was a concept of raids that worked really well to bring a lot of people together in the game at the same time, and that caused a lot of social activity. Um, kind of before you do a lot of raids, it's a lot of like small individual or small groups playing, but you don't quite force, you don't catalyze a lot of people coming together at the same time. And then we have like a lot of raids, you then get 40 or 50 people working together um, on something, and you cause a lot of like social relationships to be formed. Um, and so those types of like structures they haven't seen uh, in a lot of the games today. I'm pretty hopeful that like the as the headsets continue to get better, um, we're gonna get more of that those immersive games. Um, but I'm also like super uh, curious as to whether or not this is independent concept, like could we get those kind of versus environments just in normal um, uh, computer console games uh, you know, without having to like go away into into um, VR or XR or something like that. And you know, could you create like this kind of um metaverse type experiences just in, in normal um, 2D where the three landscapes line up ones that you experience through um, through other computers. Yeah, it's a great point. I think definitely the interaction space, there's something to be said about, you know, what that feels like. Um, recently, I tried one of the, like, you bits other side, like, trips, they call them, where you could actually be in a space with, like, 4,000 other avatars running and jumping around. It was chaos. <laughs> so um, I, I think maybe, like you said, there, there are probably multiple different, you know, reasons or vectors as to, like, why that hasn't happened yet. Could, could you talk to each other while, like, could you understand each other? No. <laughs> it was, yeah. You literally, uh, like the environment was, uh, well they, they did a few and one was actually like a really interesting environment and they basically had this giant kind of like avatar host that would guide you through um, and then you're flying around and you you heard, just heard a bunch of voices and chatter and it was like very, very difficult to have like a, you know, one-to-one -one conversation. And so it, I mean, games, these are games is still with incredible technical feats that manage to squeeze out enough performance to do something magical. Um, you can find all these amazing stories going back to like, and things like Doom and um, things like Prince of Persia and so on. These crazy adventures and just try to like, squeeze out the performance you need to create like, that magical experience. Um, and so I wonder if like, we're sort of missing that like degree of extreme feat of engineering to cause these kinds of environments to work. Um, and maybe it is, maybe it's like too easy to make a successful game now, such that like people have tried to find these incredibly amazing experiences. That's hard. I don't know. Maybe it's just too hard.
um, it's also a possibility. Yeah, um, I'd love to move on to um, you know when, when we think about virtual worlds, uh, you know why why blockchain is important. And yeah, yeah. so I think, I think this is the lot of talks a lot about the, the possibilities. Um, so now looking at two different angles. So one angle that is um, you need something that is incredibly neutral, incredibly um, impartial, incredibly verifiably um, not going to change on here um, to be able to rely on in order to run a real economy. Like the order to run a massive scale economy where you're going to have massive scale value flows where, especially in a context that is not all positive sum, where you're going to have layers um, and read about some controversy, um, you need some structure that's truly unchangeable that nobody really runs. And that's where blockchains today have given us the, the, the strongest, like truly credible, can't change it, even if I want to sort of set up. And that I think is very important and compelling for larger scale economies. I think if you, if you want to create some, you know, MMO type environment. You think of, think of think Eve, for example, right? Eve has like one of the most interesting MMO um, communities where they have like these massive capital expenditures um, with lots of player corporations that get together and like um, grind for a long time to get ships that are better, 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 and whatnot, and like make or buy these like intense ships. And then they'll, they'll get into fights with other um, factions. And have these insane battles where these ships are like that were like I don't know worth like hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars in, in like real money get like destroyed. And this is to so some people like that's insane. Like how could that possibly happen? I mean, yeah, for a lot of people like that that those communities and those environments and those virtual worlds are a big part of their lives and they have an enormous amount of fun and fulfillment from that. So it's just kind of like they're spending their normal and money on that. So like you know. Um, but you know, what they what they want for us, and for that to happen, you need some kind of. Um, and there's been a lot of controversies along the way in like, the world for that to happen at a greater degree, um, or an environment where people are like suddenly um, making their livelihood out of this environment, um, especially in light of hard controversy, you're going to need some kind of structure that that um, nobody even with an endless amount of pressure would give way to overturn it, right? So a good example here is like the DAO hack was so controversial at the time that the other community kind of like rolled back that problem and that caused such an intense disagreement in the community that led to the fork between the Ethereum and the asset. And you know, after that, the Ethereum community has that many cases of similar situations and you know, they sort of very much agree this community to never again do that. Uh, and that just shows an example of the kind of like credibility that you need to be able to run a massive scale economy. So that's one thing, one piece. Um, the other piece, which is an area that I personally really care about, is more about like privacy and human rights sort of things, I mean, civil liberties, which is that when you think about the world and the different nations around the world that have very different laws and ways of operating, many places in the world have massive scale surveillance. Um, if we create environments and worlds that start captivating a huge fraction of people's interactions, um, you start creating these extremely important places where people communicate really important things, right? So this might be more true of email or text messaging than it is of games. But when you shift to virtual worlds that, that really mean a lot of people's personal experiences in life, that's closer to important communications with people I love than it is, you know, random chat in a random game. And at that point, you really want infrastructure that is verifiably secure, that is end to end encrypted, that no party, no single third party runs or controls or can look into. And I think at that point, that's where like really Web3 as a system. Um, as a, as a system of systems, um, it's, it's kind of the strongest path to, to some, something like that. And this doesn't necessarily mean blockchains, it means um, strong cryptographic primitives underlying the communications layers and like every way of um, interacting. I think that's going to be a really important long term. So, the way that I think with Web3 
is that you have like the web, the web one was about like being able to read information, web two was about read write, and web three is really about verification, read write, verify. You need to be able to keep these interactions and verifiably commit and guarantee that they're going to keep operating in the future without having to trust any party. Um, and that's something really, really powerful and compelling. Where blockchains come in there is that blockchains give you a way to organize a public utility. So think of a blockchain as just this large scale digital public utility that a lot of people can help run. And, the, and those people get paid for running this thing, and might get earning tokens for running their computers. And nobody has to like operate it, they just kind of run it on its own. And as long as people use it, um, there is value to, to be made by helping run it, so people will do it. And that's a really powerful system. Um, it's kind of like open source meets running services. And to me, that's an extremely powerful predicate to be able to achieve this kind of verifiability and this kind of privacy uh, preserving uh, systems. Um, we have a lot of work to go to get there. Um, and I'm super excited about things like user knowledge, public work and conversion, and all that kind of stuff to achieve those kinds of those kinds of systems. So that's kind of like kind of the more serious side of it of this and like how much can be less fun and game so. Well, I mean, it's, it's a great point because it, it goes so much further than just, you know, buying new game assets. Uh, obviously, like, as we spend more and more time in these worlds, um, more of our identities are tied to these, you know, virtual beings, to the virtual things that we are, we're collecting. But, you know, as you're saying, it's going so much deeper. It, it comes down to, like, the basis of right of privacy and, you know, how our communications, how our data is handled, right? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, for a while, I've considered, like, writing in on book called 2024, which is would be kind of like nice to get more of like down today with the current technology, like not even looking ahead. Um, and like what you could do in terms of running up like a terrible authoritarian surveillance state. Um, and it's like really dark. Like the things that are possible today are alarming. Um, and it's really gonna require what it plays, uh getting it out of the like that's not really that's that protects our rights um, to to kind of avoid that kind of those kinds of outcomes. Um, the good news here is that there's like an enormous amount of people working on this now. Like, like a lot of us started working on this at 15, 20 years ago. Like it was very fringe and not a lot of people were working on it and it wasn't seen as required. Um, the awesome things that have happened since is that people have really woken up to the importance of this stuff and an enormous number of people are, are clearly working on these things. And we now have like, a massive scale system that are in sales system. We have um, Privacy preserving messaging. You know, it's normal now to have things like Signal and then to any encryption on, on messaging. Um, very far from like full proper you know, um, privacy um, or safety or security, but um, but it's kind of going in a pretty good direction. So it's like you know, kind of like five, ten years from now, FHG is going to be um, performant enough that you might be able to do something like FHG email or FHG messaging um, and that way the like. That, that, that becomes a really cool world over something that you don't have to really trust any of the computers on the way to, uh, to be able to learn messaging. Um, and so if you imagine that more and more and more where interactions as humans are going to be mediated by the internet, and if you think it's 2024 and you compare it to 2014 or 2004 and 2004, and then the fraction of the interactions that we have with the people around the world that are mediated in some way through computers of the internet and just kind of keeps going and probably going up, right? And so that's why it really matters that you're working on and fundamentally um, secure and then privacy for survey if they're secure. Yeah. I, I would love to move on to um, talking a little bit more about uh, specifically spatial computing, you know, AR, VR, um, which I know you're really excited about. And with Protocol Labs, you know, focus area of yours that I know is, uh, you know, preserving mutual human rights. Um, but I'm, I'm curious um, to hear about your thoughts on the intersection between everything from you know BCI, AI, and, and how this is going to impact uh, the future of uh, XR. Yeah, no, sorry. There's a lot of uh, intersecting pieces there. So I would say like um, there are, there are some blockers to getting all the spatial computing stuff to really work. Um, and if I have this, this will kind of reach that zone. Um, they always feel like five years away. They think five years away, like 15 to 20 years. Um, um, they kind of feel five years away now, but like I really hope that I'm not saying it's five years from now. Um, I think at some point we are going to hit like this crazy ticket point that will feel like the mobile phone to your point. Like mobile phones went from a period of like, you know, smartphones being kind of a curiosity that a few people had, to suddenly everyone had them, to suddenly like, 
it was extremely rare to not have one. Um, and I think headsets will probably follow a similar trajectory. I don't mean necessarily the current have really big headsets that exist. Um, as technology gets better, things get miniaturized, and so we might end up seeing like some of the much nicer form factors where you have like small glasses um, that are able to like render in front of you. Um, and certainly, once we have PCIs, like this whole other that opens up uh, a totally different direction. So um, one of the things I'm personally extremely excited about is um, optic PCIs. Um, the applications for those initially will be about um, uh, curing diseases where you know, there are a lot of people with um, optical diseases where they're either fully blind or partially blind um, for a bunch of reasons. And there are PCIs right now being figured out that are directly attacking that problem is we will have implants in market um, in the next few years that are able to implant a device onto the eye and restore sight. And that becomes an extremely powerful and compelling thing uh, for the time in the world um, that some of those diseases. And in addition, they open up the door to this um, spatial computing side or augmented reality side where once you have those kinds of implants, you don't just get to render the normal physical world where photons are like reflecting, but you get to render other things too. And that might open up the avenue. So in my mind right now, like the, the BCI stuff is happening now so well and so fast that we might get those um, you know, in high fidelity before we get um, has that small enough and cheap enough and simple enough that a lot of people want to have one and wear one for many hours, right? So like, you, there's this problem with headsets where like it's just, they're just too large and clunky, um, and so it could be that like we end up with no, actually we're going to skip headsets altogether. We're just going to go straight to optical PCIs. Uh, not sure. Um, there are of course a massive amount of problems there to solve between you know real time AV communications and massive scale player settings to solve. Um, I don't think the current architecture of support walls for for doing these things work at all. Um, I think there, this is going to require like a, a much more clear pair communication stack, um, but that's a whole other you know, implementation detail sort of sort of model. So you say in a few years, do you think with the uh, retinal implants that'll be possible? Yeah, I mean, that could be um, or obviously here, but I, but I personally think like it'll be that within somewhere between two to five years, uh, five years with like the more conservative side, I think we'll have like. Um, yeah, I'll do one glance. That's remarkable. And, and a lot of people working for, there's several people working on these. Um, it's all like they're working on these, so, um, yeah. Yeah, that's truly remarkable. Um, and, and those will be a few people, and those will be for curing diseases. I don't think they'll have consumer-oriented, augmentative, optical ones. I think that will take another three to five years, or like the overthinking into a band, maybe. Like a while more be before they become cheap enough at all. Like, yeah, so they spend 15 years to a better um, place. Again, these, these, these things could be accelerated a lot, right? So um, it really depends. Once you get like a few hundred people working on something at scale and you, you, you can achieve cash flow, you can accelerate this stuff dramatically. Um, think of deep learning, right? Like deep learning was um, kind of a death field for a very long time. It had a few staunch believers that understood the impact and kept working on it. Um, and it wasn't until you know things like Alice and a few other um, successes that they were able to convince the rest of the world that there was really something there. Um, and then as soon as you got like a few hundred extremely high quality researchers and enough capital to get the GPUs to be able to run the experiments, the entire speed of the field dramatically changed. And so the entire field accelerated at a point where um, you know the things we've seen in the last you know, from 2012 to now. Um, it, it could have taken 20 years to do, um, or 20, even 30 years, but they got about a lot faster because everyone sort of understood that this was the way forward. Um, and so with all the BCI stuff, like, we could see this crazy inflection point where suddenly a lot of people um, uh, accelerate these fields. Um, I don't know. It's, is funding probably one of the biggest blockers for all of this? For thing? sure. Uh, funding is a massive blocker. So part of what made the, all the current AI progress possible was that Google and, and Facebook both understood how important and critical all of this was going to be, and they applied billions into this, um, billions per year um, on the now, right? So massive capital outlays 
to fund tons of people and labs and hardware um, to be able to achieve this. So for CIs, I think like we, we do need you know in the in the scales of like per year to to get there. Um, I think we're not yet there. I think as soon as we can unlock a big cash flow, that we're we'll, we'll be set. It, innovation is kind of like weird this way, where um, you know how like lightning works, where like uh, it starts kind of coming down and it's explores two pathways kind of slowly, and then it hits the ground and there's like a charge back, and it, that's what the light really occurs. R&D is sort of like that, where like, there's a search process with a few people like going slowly. It's very difficult for a while. And as soon as they get a product that can operate at scale that has product market fit, you suddenly are able to um, harness this massive cash flow that goes back and like, drives a lot of the, the early stage R&D. Um, and so I think you know, as soon as we can hit that for VCI, that we'll see a lot of um, growth. Same thing for um, headsets and normal VR and so on. Uh, my guess of what Apple has been focused on is like, um, really nailing the killer app as a movie watching. Um, first, the time in the software with a lot of individuals, and then later move on to the multiplayer games, um, or the multiplayer experience. I guess what with the with the quest has been more focused on social experiences, and I think a few games have like really nailed it. But for the most part, like it still is it still doesn't feel like it's really like a must have sort of thing yet. Um, but at some point, we'll, we'll see that's a big point. Yeah, it's, it's still definitely really early. Um, the Apple headset is, is by far just what they're achieving with pass through is, is really remarkable, but as you said, it's still very heavy. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. They definitely seem to be focusing on productivity and also just like consuming content, but we'll see how that changes over the next couple of years. Yeah, it's a lot easier to make them an individual content experience or like a better uh, to do it in the virtual, you know, an environment where you're doing multiplayer things and latency and people can drop off and whatnot. Like, uh, I think huge kudos to a lot of the groups that have tied it from, you know, like to meta to a lot of groups that like, um, you know, really try to do the incredibly hard engineer to try and make that work in large settings with lots of parties. Yeah, uh, I think we, we probably just have a few minutes left, so maybe we'd just love to end on, um, you know, we're all here at Edge Esmeralda, it's a very intentional community, um, trying to build the future, a better future for everyone. Um, in your opinion, we'd love to kind of like try to bring it back to everyone here. Uh, how can everyone here who's you know listening to this, watching, and uh, how can we work together to really like push the space forward when we think about virtual worlds, the metaverse? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, I personally think all of this sort of stuff benefits an enormous amount from just tight iteration loops with lots of experiments, lots of feedback, lots of like excitement. I think back to the old group of computer club that you know was the beginning of the virtual computer revolution. Um, I think for some reason, it's become harder to have that kind of experience um, as the world has become more fragmented and there's you know, innovation globally or whatever, and that sort of happens in like larger iteration cycles. And so I would just kind of like, to, to really drive a lot of this innovation, A, you could like be a strong consumer and feedback giver of all the experiments that people are putting out there. That's like the lowest effort things you could do. You like try things out, um, give feedback along the way, you know, suggest ideas, come up with things, write them up broadcast on Twitter or whatever um, whatever. Um, the I think what you, the the cool like kind of like the next level is like try experimenting yourself and try maybe making things and try making things with another with other people and try to like get a lot of cross pollination of ideas and try to get like full demos and really go for those like captivating experiences that just feel really cool. It's one of the things that I think um, you know there's just a few VR demos out there that just like feel really good and like that's the kind of um, captivating experience that you, that you want to try and get. And if we can get some of those experiences with multiplayer setting, like that could be a really good fun thing. Um, and then third, I think like maybe think through like what are the sort of large scale um, uh, experiences that are going to be very long term captivating to lots of people um, that are going to be like really helpful, like really good, but really useful, whether it's because people are playing some really compelling. Um, High rate fulfillment uh, game or an environment or, or some experience that you can have together that would be very difficult otherwise. Um, or, you know, I'm impossible otherwise because you know, in a virtual world, you get to present whatever you want. Um, or things are extremely productive and helpful for 20,000 people. Um, I would, you know, I was kind of like part of the generation that saw Skype up here, like over the world pre video chat to like now you can have video chat. And just kind of like the level of fulfillment that I can see in my mom and family members that like 
didn't see each other at all, or like very rarely, and then suddenly being able to like video call each other. Like the feeling of like, wow, this is such a crazy different world. Um, you know, when you grow up with it, it's sort of like normal. Um, and so I think things like that will happen with these kinds of immersive interactions that'll break it. Everyone is not fulfilling it to a lot of people. So I know, try it for experiences. Love that. Thank you so much, Juan. Really appreciate it.